What's up, Verb? How's everybody doing today? Everybody doing all right? Happy Sunday, fun day. Great to be in the house with you, and uh, it's been an honor to be here over the past couple of days. And um, as you heard, I'm Mark. I'm the lead pastor of a church in Delaware called The Journey, and uh, I am so honored to be at Verve this weekend. I've had an incredible time the past couple of days. I love this church family. I love your pastors and leaders. I had an opportunity uh, yesterday to spend a couple of hours with a, a bunch of your leaders from Rancho and here in Riverside and just coaching, and I love the health that I see and the heart for you. Your pastors and leaders love you and are grateful for you. And kind of like they talk all the time about you. It's like they just can't stop talking about you. So if you like being led by people that like you, you're in, you're in a good church. Um, and I want to give big honor to Pastors Donnie and Sonia. Love them so much. I've gotten to know them over the past couple of years and so impressed with their integrity and their heart for God and heart for this, uh, this church family and these cities that God's calling you into. And of course, my very dear friends, Pastor Chris Ensley and Jen got an opportunity uh, to be at the Rancho campus this morning and then drive really fast over to the Riverside campus. And I felt like, you know, I was driving for Jesus. So it just, you know, it was like, I feel like the speed limit doesn't matter right now. I got to get to church. That's really bad theology. So don't apply that and then call me when you're in jail. Um, but I'm just very glad to be here. And I want to give honor as well to Pastor Merla. I'm so impressed with you. I've had an opportunity just the past few years to watch your leadership grow, and I'm really proud of you. You're a great leader, and, and uh, just love the team here. And I'm very excited to have my daughter Maddie in the house, my daughter Madeline right here. And uh, she is she does not love public displays, so I will just leave it at that. But she is my favorite daughter, so um, she does happen to be my only daughter, but that's just a coincidence. She is my favorite daughter. And then I brought a picture of my family as well. I think we have a picture of my family. Do we have a picture of my family? No? Okay. Well, at Rancho, there was a picture of my family. They looked awesome. You'll just have to take my word for it. Uh, but my wife, Susie, and my son, Connor, um, are just holding down the fort in Delaware. Had to twist Maddie's arm to come with me to Southern California, you know, and in February. And uh, back in Delaware, we don't have mountains. We don't have sunshine. And uh, we're just holding on to Jesus. So, okay. <laughs> Last thing I want to say before we jump into the message today is I just want to honor all of you who serve here. And thank you for the way that you are leading the way, front line, behind the scenes, worship, kids, production, leading groups, and pastoral care, wherever you serve. Thank you for being a part of this community of faith. We are in week three of a series on relationships called to, to tango. How many of us know how to do the tango? Just by a show of hands. Okay. That's much better. At Rancho, there was nobody. I only raised my hand as an example. I have no idea how to actually do the tango. I'm wondering if we should ask for a demonstration, but that's probably too much. No, we're not going to do that. Okay. Uh, but I have no idea how to do the dance, but I am familiar with the expression. The idea is in this complicated yet potentially beautiful dance, it takes two. You can't do it alone. You got to do it in a rhythm with another person. So whether we're single, married, divorced, young, old, dating, not sure we ever want to date again, whatever our beliefs are when it comes to God or church, we're asking the question during this series, how do we make our relationships work when it seems like there's so much working against us? And how could everything in our lives potentially improve if our relationships got better? And it's been a fantastic series already. I've been kind of looking watching from a distance, your pastors, Donnie and Sonia, have been up here uh, together on stage, which is brave. Am I right? So I didn't bring my wife today, so I get the whole time by myself. So she's not here to give her side of the story. Uh, so you're just going to have to take my word for it. And pretty amazing. We celebrated this this morning, but pastors, Donnie and Sonia, have been married for 23 years, which I think is incredible. And I just wanted to point out that I've been married for 25 years. So I'm not saying it's a competition. I'm just saying if it were, I am winning. So, okay. A few years after we got married, my wife Susie and I had a disagreement. How many of us have had a disagreement? Whether you're married or not, whether you just, you've had a disagreement. How many of us have had one over the past 24 hours just by a show of hands? It's okay. It's all right. You've had one. Some of us went. You know, we're pointing at the reason for our disagreement. Who's here with us today? 
So we had a disagreement. This was early in our marriage, and uh, we had actually quite a few disagreements, especially early in our marriage. But the reason I remember this one is it got a little heated. We were really frustrated with each other. And in a moment of exasperation, I asked my wife, Susie, this question, this life-giving question. What is fundamentally wrong with you? (laughs) Couldn't make this up. I know some of you are wondering, did you ever see her again? Yes, same woman. I married the same woman. That day, I saw the goodness of God in the land of the living, you know, just the mercy of God, just barely the land of the living, by the way, but just the mercy of God present in that moment. But even though I'm the one who said it, uh, Susie would tell you if she were here that she was wondering exactly the same thing about me. And now years later, this has become the stuff of legend for us. We laugh about it now. Of course, we weren't laughing at the time. That question, what is fundamentally wrong with you? How many of us have wondered that about somebody we're, we're related to or friends with or dating or married to or used to be married to? What is fundamentally wrong with you? And uh, there aren't a lot of honest people in the room. Who've, who've, you know, how many of us, just by a show of hands, have wondered? Just, just help me out here. It's, okay. How many of us have just said in that we're at church? And we need to tell the truth because we're at church. How many of us have ever wondered about anybody? What is fundamentally wrong with you? Yeah, you're not like me. You didn't verbalize it, but you wondered it. Relationships are hard, right? They challenge us. They disappoint us. They fulfill us. They stretch us. Just sometimes it's a roller coaster ride and they leave us wondering, why is this other person so different from me? Fundamentally different. Well, there's some stuff in the Bible that can really help us with this and help us understand what this is all about and how we can get better at our relationships when we learn to navigate this. So it's written to a church, but it's really about relationships. I'm going to get practical in a few minutes, so stay with me. But first, I want to lay the groundwork. Here's what we read. In the New Testament of the Bible, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. And so it is with the body of Christ. Now, For some of you today, maybe you're kind of new to the church thing. Maybe you're kicking the tires, trying to figure out what you believe about God and church. And I'm very glad you're here. You don't have to believe anything you're not ready to believe yet. Just keep checking it out. See what God could do in your life. But you might be interested to know that this is how church is described in the Bible, that it's the body of Christ. It's very fascinating to me. This is a body made up of many parts, and yet it's just one body. It's kind of like a puzzle. A puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle is made up of many pieces, but it just makes one complete picture. A puzzle often can have hundreds, if not thousands of pieces, but it just makes one complete picture. And the picture doesn't make sense without all the pieces, but any given piece doesn't really make sense without the whole picture either. So each piece is shaped differently, but when it connects with the other pieces, it creates this bigger picture. And that's what God had in mind for church. Now, for God intended church to be a community of interdependent people, uniquely shaped, but all working together to form something bigger than they could ever come up with on their own. That's church, but that's church. I mean, what about our dating life or our married life or our single life or our single again life? Well, this is actually a picture of all of our of our relationships. The health that God wants in all of our relationships comes down to this teaching from the New Testament. I mean, think about it. A family is made up of many parts, yet it's just one whole family, right? So all of the different parts of the family, if everybody's independent in a family doing their own thing, the family never really makes progress. If everybody's codependent, like they don't have boundaries, they are dysfunctional in their relationships, the family doesn't make much progress. But when everybody is interdependent in a family, then that family can be healthy. Same with a circle of friends, same with a group or a marriage. As soon as you have at least two people trying to do life together, You have different parts, different personalities, different perspectives, and the potential for a beautiful picture. It really does take two to tango. But how many of us know you also have the potential for problems? As soon as you have at least two people trying to do life together, there's the potential 
for problems. Listen to the word of God. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I am not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? So for all of us who become followers of Jesus, for all of us in the room who put our faith in Jesus Christ as leader and Lord of our lives, when you found Jesus, your life was transformed, right? You became a new creation. Yet there's a lot about you that is exactly the same as it was before you found Jesus. If you were tall when you found Jesus, guess what? You're still tall. If you were short when you found Jesus, speaking for a friend, <laughs> guess what? You are still short. Sometimes I've wondered, God, you totally recreated my heart when I put my faith in Jesus. Why couldn't you also make me six foot four so I could dunk? And I feel like I hear God whispering back to me, it would take a lot more than height, Johnston. You do not have the athletic genes. You would hurt yourself. That's why I made you five foot eight. So then I'm at peace. I'm content. But the reality is I did not change fundamentally in my shape. And it goes further. I did not change in my personality. If you were extroverted before you found Jesus, you're probably still extroverted. If you were introverted before you found Jesus, you're probably still introverted. You say, oh, no, no, no. Before I found Jesus, I didn't like people, and now I like people. Oh, so you're a healthy introvert. But you're still an introvert. <laughs> in other words, when we find Jesus, this is so important. When we find Jesus, we do not lose who we are. We find who we are. In fact, Jesus said it this way, if you want to follow me, you have to abandon your life. He was not saying we need to abandon the life God always created us to live. He was saying we need to abandon our version of living, which was not God's best for us. And when we do, sometimes we forget this part. He says, then you will find your life. When we find Jesus, we find our real life. The person we were always intended by God to be. Now, why is this so important? Because we live in a world that often affirms our uniqueness. And that's good, right? Have you heard the saying, you do you? How many of us have heard that? You do you. Hey, you do you, boo. Like, you do you. You just, you do you. You do you. It sounds great. It's true-ish. The only question I have is, why? Why should I be me? Why should I be my unique self? And if you ask that in the context of our world without a faith perspective, there's no good answer. You do you. Why? I don't know. Just it seems like the right thing to do. Well, why? I don't know. Stop asking questions and do you. Just you do you. But when we find Jesus, here's what we begin to experience. Now we have purpose to our uniqueness and we understand that we were meant to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. So we submit our uniqueness to Jesus and to each other for the sake of something bigger. We bring our different gifts and personalities to the table, but now it's not just for the sake of ourselves, it's for the sake of the table. We're a part of something bigger, the body of Christ. But here's what happens so often in our relationships. We mistake differences in personality or perspective as differences in value. We mistake differences in personality or perspective as differences in value. I mean, we think, okay, you're different, so you must be wrong. Yeah. You don't see things the way that I see things, so you must be wrong. And you know what? Honestly, you must be fundamentally wrong. Something must be fundamentally wrong with you that you're not seeing what I'm seeing. So after that fateful moment in our marriage when I asked Susie what was fundamentally wrong with her, we started slowly to learn how to do life together in a much healthier way that not all of our differences meant something was fundamentally wrong with us. We started to appreciate our differences and to highlight the part that each of us was uniquely shaped to play in our relationship. See, in any relationship, there are different parts, and the different parts make up the one whole relationship. In fact, can I just tell you that another kind of thing that's happening in our world is that on one side you have this message of you do you, be unique, but on the other side, we're trying to eliminate the unique attributes that God gave us and say that they don't matter. But God says that in relationships, actually, there are different parts that play different 
roles and have different moments of contributing to that relationship, and the different parts make up one whole relationship. For instance, this is a foot. Now, this is not a real foot. That'd be weird. This would be the last time I would ever speak at Verve if this was a real foot. So for those of you in the back, it's not a real foot. But pretend with me that it's real. Can we all agree that a foot on its own is absolutely terrifying? If you go home today and there is a human foot lying outside your door, can we all agree that the only appropriate response is to run screaming in the opposite direction? Call 911, get the police, get everybody. Bruno would say, get the fireman. I mean, you just need everybody. Sorry, I couldn't help myself. You need everybody. You'll get it later. You need everybody to come help you because you just found a human foot outside your door. You do not like go, get your camera. Bit. No, that's weird. Don't do that. It's a foot. Which is, by the way, exactly how terrifying we should find it when we meet a Christian who's not connected to the church. So if you got like a friend at work or something like, I'm a Christian, you're like, oh, I'm a Christian too. What community of faith are you a part of? Tell me about how you do life with other Christians. Oh, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't do the church thing. Ah! You call 911. I just found a Christian lying on the ground, separated from the body of Christ. Quick, send somebody. Okay, that's just an aside. But you understand, we got to be a part of the church because a foot on its own, terrifying. So what if the foot says, you know what? I don't really like this relationship. I don't belong here. I'm not the hand. I'm out. I don't want to do this anymore. Can we all agree that that does not play out well for the foot, the hand, or the rest of the body, right? Okay, well, this is an ear. It's not a real ear. That'd be weird. But pretend it is. Can you imagine if the ear says, being attached to the same body as the eye... It's not working for me. I don't, like, I don't like how it's all about the seeing. Why is everybody so into seeing? Seeing is not all there is. Hearing is more important than seeing. I am going to disconnect from the body. I don't like this. The, the eyes are kind of messing with me. I'm going to go find some ears just like me, and I'm just going to hang out with other ears. Can we all agree that does not play out well for the ear, the eye, the head, or the rest of the body? Now, for some of us, we're going, okay, this is so basic. It's so simplistic. Obviously, my ear is not going to detach from my head and go hang out with other ears. That would be so bizarre. Exactly. Listen, immature people only see other people through the lens of their own personality and preferences. But mature people get it. Our differences don't make us better or worse. They just make us different. And our relationships begin to work when we understand that. Now, I know some of us might be nervous right now because we're thinking, what about real issues that I have in a relationship? What about real issues that my parent has or my fiance has, my spouse, my kid, my sibling? There may be legitimate issues. There may need to be conflict in that relationship or confrontation. Sometimes an ear gets infected. Sometimes a foot smells like funk. And it is appropriate for the rest of the body to say, foot, we got to fix this whole thing because we're going to lose friends in a hurry. You smell like funk. That's appropriate. So I know that there are real issues in our relationships. But listen, we will never make progress with those issues until we begin to understand that underneath those issues, there is a person, not just a problem. A person who has the potential to play a very important part in the relationship and in our lives. That if that person were healthy and is healthy, they actually fit into the puzzle of what God has in mind. They're just different from us. And those differences, again, I'm talking about personality and perspective. I'm not talking about sin or dysfunctional behavior. But those differences where we just can't see eye to eye can either become a recipe for resentment or for a more fulfilling relationship. In fact, here's what God's word says. If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. 
I lead a great team of pastors at The Journey. Uh, we have a, a bunch of great pastors and leaders on our team, and there's a specific group we call our lead team that I work with very closely. We meet every week. We do life together, ministry together. We're very close. We've worked together for years, but we meet every week. And at the start of our meeting a few years ago, we decided that we were going to say this little saying together. So every meeting we begin just like this. This is my team. Its success is my success. I win if this team wins. I lose if this team loses. This is my team. Its success is my success. I win if this team wins. I lose if this team loses. Why? Because it reminds us that we are not just a bunch of individual contributors. We're interdependent. We work together. There are differences on our team. And we're reminded when we say that little saying, as simple as it may sound, we're reminded every time we meet that our differences don't make us better or worse. They just make us different. So in the moments when we're hashing something out or we're struggling with something that people have different opinions about, we want to be reminded that there is a greater puzzle God is working to put together. And if we will work together and humble ourselves and respect and honor each other's perspectives, we can make progress in the body of Christ. And God wants the same thing in your relationships. What would happen if you adopted this? This is my family. Its success is my success. I win if this family wins. I lose if this family loses. This is my marriage. Its success is my success. I win if this marriage wins. I lose if this marriage loses. This is my church. Its success is my success. I win if this church wins. I lose if this church loses. What would happen in your life if you adopted that, if I adopted that, if we started to live that way? What if the person you're so frustrated with right now because they don't think like you think, see what you see, react the way you react, was actually placed there by God just the way he wanted. And some would say, well, I would like them a lot more if they were more like me. How many of us have thought that? Like, if they were just more like me, because I am awesome. <laughs> and if everybody was just more like me, I'm a type A. How many type A personalities in the room? All of you who raised your hand immediately, you're the real type A's. Anybody that it took more than 0.4 seconds, you're not really a type A. The type A's were like, did you ask me to raise my hand? I did. I'm a type A, okay? And so many times, I want everybody else in the world to be as assertive and driven and fast-moving as I am. And do you know what kind of world we would live in if everybody was like that? Not a good one, ladies and gentlemen. Some of us are much more laid back. How many of us are laid back? I'll wait for you. Still got another minute. All right, there it is. There it is. Got some people like, you know what? Those of you who are laid back, you have thought to yourself, man, I don't understand these type A people. They're always kind of making a mess, and they're always so driven. I wish the whole world was filled with laid back people. Do you know what the world would be like if it was filled with laid back people? It would not be good. We would never get where we need to go. In other words, we need each other. We need each other in our church. We need each other in our families. We need each other in our marriages. Come on, stop getting into this place where the conflict becomes so personal and there's something wrong with you and you just don't see it the way I see it. Let's live in the space that God intended us to live in, which is our differences don't make us better, better or worse, just different. Listen to this. How strange a body would be if it only had one part. Can we all agree? That's a horror movie waiting to happen. Here comes a giant ear. Oh. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. When Paul wrote this to these believers in the city of Corinth, they had some good things going for them as a church, but they had some issues. And one of their biggest issues was that people in this church were arguing and bickering over who was most important. They were saying, my gifts are actually the most important gifts. And my role in the body is actually the one that should be recognized the most. They were full of pride. And Paul, who writes this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, that's 
crazy. That's like feet and ears and eyes and noses fighting over which of them is most important. It doesn't make any sense. It's what we're part of that gives us our ultimate significance. Our differences don't make us better or worse. They just make us different. So what does this mean? It means that each of us is responsible to bring the very best us to our relationships. Stop backing the bus over the person, the other person in the relationship, blaming them for all of the problems. And we take ownership and we say, I am responsible to bring the best me into this relationship. And part of bringing the best us means leaving space for what makes the other person different from us. And again, I want to be very clear. I'm not talking about sin or dysfunctional behavior that dishonors God, that that should be tolerated. I don't mean that. But too often we get embroiled in conflicts that really have more to do with personality and perspective than they do those things. And here's the other reality. Why do we struggle with this? Because very few of us have healthy examples to look to. For a lot of us, myself included, we grew up in families. We've seen all kinds of different dynamics that were anything but God's best. We've seen independence in relationships where everybody just does their own thing, regardless of how it affects anybody else. Some of us have seen codependent relationships where dysfunctional behavior is tolerated just so you don't rock the boat. But very few of us have seen healthy interdependent relationships. What is an interdependent relationship? That's where I know who I am and I have clear boundaries, but I don't do what I do anymore just for the sake of myself, but for the sake of others. I have the spirit of Christ. I'm a servant in the relationship. And I respect and honor the other person, even when I disagree. Those kinds of relationships are rare. That's why we're doing this series. That's why part of being, or why being a part of a life-giving community of faith like this is so important. To be doing life with people, going the same direction spiritually, so that we begin to build imperfect but healthy examples of godly relationships. So for this week, what do you do? First, stop wondering what is fundamentally wrong with the people in your life. <laughs> and then from there, here's what I want to challenge you to do, week three of the series. Make a commitment to know and understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. To know and understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. What does that mean? It means it takes two to tango. And you get to know the other person you're in a relationship with. And I mean the person you're actually in a relationship with, by the way, not your fantasy version of that person. You get to know the person you're actually married to, not the person you wish you were married to. You get to know the parent you actually have, not your friend's parent who's so much cooler than your parent. You get to know the kid you actually have, not the kid that your friend has who seems to always get straight A's and do everything just right. You get to know them, your actual person that you're connected to. And then you lay down your resentment. You resist the urge to blame or withdraw. And you begin to ask lots of questions. It means you seek first to understand. Some of us in relationships right now are demanding to be understood. But when you live this way, you seek first to understand. You want to get to know the other person. You replace your criticism with curiosity. Verbalize the other person's strengths. Actually say, you are, I challenge you this week, actually say, you are really good at X. You say, I can't say that because they're so bad at A through W. I know, but I'm challenging you. <laughs> Find a strength and verbalize it. You are really good at this. And then seek to understand the other person's weaknesses. And again, have boundaries. Be clear about your values. I'm not talking about tearing down any of those things. But then seek to understand the other person's weaknesses. He gives you the silent treatment because when he was growing up and his dad got angry, his dad punched a wall, yelled, and threw things. And he doesn't want to do that, but he doesn't have any other tools in his toolbox, so he just gets quiet. Does that mean that behavior doesn't need to be addressed? No, but it means that now you bring compassion to the relationship. You understand where that comes from. 
You start to learn she gets angry and loses her temper when she's scared. So it's not just a personal attack. There's fear under the surface. He stops returning his text when he's feeling ashamed. She forgets things when she's struggling with anxiety. Doesn't mean those issues don't need to be addressed. It means that now you know and understand. I know, I, I see how God designed you and how you're struggling to find your shape. And I bring compassion to that. Let's not allow the world to convince us our only options are to agree or hate. There is another way. There is another way. I'm going to know who you are. I'm going to understand how God shaped you and what you're dealing with. Why is this so important? Here's why. Last verse. This makes for harmony. Wouldn't you love to have harmony in your relationships? This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members, what? Care for each other. And if one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Harmony. How do we get harmony in our relationships? It starts with at least one person in the relationship deciding. Their differences don't make them better or worse. Just different. And here's how you can live this out when it comes to your faith. Listen, if you're brand new to all of this, come back next weekend. If you're a Christian, don't be a foot (laughs) lying out there somewhere going, I'm a Christian. Get connected to the body. Get in a group. Get in a small group and do life with people. And I've, by the way, been a lead pastor for almost 16 years. And the first few years I used to say, get in a group. Then a few years in, I learned to say, and show up for it. I had just forgotten important information. Some of you have signed up for a group, but you just haven't been. And you feel like, well, God's going to grow me just by virtue of, of signing up for it. God does a lot of mysterious things. That is not one of them. All right, you have to go to grow. Get in a group. Do life with some people. Go in the same direction spiritually. Why? So you can know and understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. So you can practice healthy relationships in a Jesus-centered community. Get on a serve crew. If you're not serving yet, that means that you're not plugged into the puzzle the way God wants you to be plugged into the puzzle. You're a piece. You don't make sense without this puzzle. And this puzzle doesn't make sense without you. Interdependent. And then for this week in your relationships, here's my challenge. Make a commitment to know and understand the strengths and weaknesses of that other person. Because those differences don't make them better or worse. Just different. And if you receive that today, if you would say, I want harmony in my relationships. I want healing in my relationships. Would you just lift your hand all over the room? Yeah, just saying, I want that. Let me pray it over us. Father, we come to you, the one who designed us, who created us, who loves us. God, thank you for bringing us into community with each other. Thank you for bringing us into this house today to hear your word. I pray over relationships that are struggling. I pray right now in the name of Jesus over marriages that are dealing with conflict and unresolved issues and the pain just seems so great. I pray that God, this week, somebody in the room, at least one person in that marriage would make the decision. I am gonna seek to understand rather than demanding to be understood. God, I pray for families that are fragmented siblings that haven't spoken to each other and parents and kids that are at odds with each other. I pray that you'd bring healing by the power of Jesus into those family relationships. Help us live with the spirit of Christ, knowing and understanding the people you've placed in our lives. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And while you let God speak to you for just a moment more today, listen, if you're in the room, and you don't have a real relationship with God yet for yourself, if you don't know Jesus personally, today can be your day. The most important relationship in your life is your relationship with the God who created you and loves you. And through faith in Jesus who died to forgive your sins and rose again, you can start that relationship with God for yourself for real today. So I'm gonna lead us in prayer again. 
And I want everyone to join me. Just open your heart up to God. And then if that's you today, if you want to get to know God, if you want to put your faith in Jesus, right where you are, whisper out a prayer of faith, something like this. You can use my words if it helps you, but pray with faith from your heart. Jesus, today, I believe in you. I believe you died to forgive my sins. I believe you rose again. You are leader and Lord of my life from this day forward. I'm going to follow you. And if that's you, while everyone around you stays focused on God, if you would say, I want to be included in that prayer today, I'm putting my faith in Jesus. Will you lift your hand just so I can see it? Just hold it up high. Yeah, yeah. Putting my faith in Jesus, yes, yes, yes. It's amazing, yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Thank God. And then, Verve, would you help me? Let's put those hands together. Let's give Jesus all the praise, all the thanks. Thank you guys so much.